for was, is uh, God why? Uh, it was a question, and then for the topic is uh, the notion of accommodation. Uh, it's the idea that God uh, adapts the language that he uses when communicating with finite humans so that we can understand him better. That's in a nutshell, what accommodation is. Uh, I like Calvin's metaphor, uh, a little simpler to understand. Calvin called it baby talk. Uh, so that, that gives you the idea of what accommodation is, and I, I'm interested in how uh, God accommodated his revelation uh, in the Bible to uh, uh, the cosmological notions that the ancient uh, people had. And you are all as aware as, as I am of all of the debates uh, in, the, you know, in the church and in, uh, among Christian uh, scientists over these kinds of questions. And, I, and my hope is that uh, a communication model that I study called relevance theory, uh, that it, it offers a, a model of communication that gives us handles for understanding uh, a, a little more precisely what I think is happening uh, in this notion of revelation being accommodated uh, to finite uh, understanding. When I was uh, teaching at, uh, at another institution, <clears throat> uh, I was talking with a faculty colleague. Uh, we got out of chapel and headed back to the academic building. And I, uh, and I held up uh, an apple and I said, I'm going to keep the doctor away. Now, what, what did I just communicate to my colleague? A fantasy. Sorry? A fantasy. What, well, okay, a fantasy, yeah, especially as I get older, I realize that. But what, of course, I, I'm going to eat an apple. Uh, and now, it, the understanding of, uh, of my, uh, my communication uh, depended in part on the prop, because I, I said, I'm going to keep the doctor away. But the physical prop needed to be there for him to connect to a well-known proverb uh, in English, uh, you know, in English literature that uh, connects apples and, and uh, no offense, uh, Dr. Uh, Warren, but keeping doctors away. And uh, so I, um, I, I relied on the prop. I was also relying on the uh, assumption that we both share that when chapel gets out, we eat lunch. So he, you know, he was able to connect eating and he knew what I was going to be eating uh, for lunch. And so he, you know, he, he and I were sharing uh, this notion of the, con the physical context, the apple that we could both see. Uh, we were sharing a, a well-known proverb of which I only uttered half of, and he had to supply the other half from memory. We shared in common the, the temporal, the, the time situation uh, at our institution and how, how it related to eating uh, anything. And he put all that together in, in the blink of an eye, and he was able to, to uh, understand what I was telling him. Now, that's a rather trivial thing to tell a colleague that you see pretty much every day that I'm going to have an apple for lunch. Uh, and so there, there was something uh, even more significant beyond the trivial in that the day before we had had a uh, a faculty meeting in which we were discussing that's, you know, <laughs> putting it, you know, Miley was a rather intense discussion in the, among the faculty about the, how important uh, the background information was to understanding the Bible, Old and New Testament. And we were on two different sides of, of the, the debate in terms of just how important uh, is uh, cultural backdrop to understanding uh, the Bible. And he, you know, he kind of smiled at me warmly. We're friends. And he smiled at me warmly. And I didn't need to say anything. He didn't need to say anything. But we both understood that I was continuing our conversation uh, from the day before in the faculty meeting that I think that context is extremely important to communication. Uh, and I sort of zinged him with one, you know, in good, friendly uh, humor uh, by using the uh, illustration of uh, keeping the doctor away while I was holding up an, an apple. That illustration, I think, does uh, really help us to see just how sensitive communication can be to the cultural assumptions 
that are in the backdrop uh, between people in, in the communication uh, process. And relevance theory is, uh, is a communication model that helps uh, it, it tackle those kinds of, of questions because it, uh, it uh, looks intensely at the assumptions that people are holding in their minds uh, in any act of uh, communication. So uh, relevance theorists, uh, they talk about this thing called cognitive environment. Now, if you're into biblical studies, that's a common term yeah, in biblical studies as well. That, that's the, basically the context, that, broadly speaking, uh, of, uh, of the Bible uh, and the people who are writing it uh, and preaching, the prophets preaching or the apostles proclaiming the gospel, whatever the, the original communication situation was, there's a cognitive environment uh, that they uh, participate in, and they all share uh, assumptions, uh, sometimes uh, to different degrees, more or less. Sometimes there are assumptions that aren't shared at all. And so a person who's communicating depends upon what they perceive are going to be shared assumptions. And they make a statement using words that are, in a sense, triggers or signals or guides to narrow the, the context to those assumptions that are relevant to the particular uh, communication that's taking place. What's necessary to put together, you know, a half a proverb, a physical object, a time of day, and, and put all that together with a memory of something yesterday, all those assumptions are necessary to wire together and, and make sense of uh, communication that is being made. Now, in our interest here, notice the, the founders, uh, uh, Daniel Sperber and Deirdre Wilson, uh, they talk about what context is, and notice they throw in there uh, think that things that people believe uh, about uh, scientific uh, assumptions, scientific hypotheses. Now, you know, we have a lot of those a lot more now than the ancient audience had. Uh, and we can talk later if you want about what science even was in the ancient world. But this notion of assumptions includes everything and anything that a person could be aware of, uh, including how they perceive the natural world uh, around them. There's another concept in relevance theory that is important, and it's the notion of accessibility. <clears throat> if, if we're imagine ourselves in an elevator, and there is uh, a conversation taking place next to us, that uh, that is a very salient or manifest or you know in your face kind of uh, of uh, event going on that draws your attention. It's very accessible. Uh, and very salient or very uh, manifest uh, in front of you. Now, in the elevator, there's music playing in the background. That's, you know, you may not even think about it. It's just sort of there in the background. <clears throat> uh, it's there. You're probably not even conscious of it. That's what we call it elevator music, right? And uh, so you're very tuned into the conversation, whether you want to or not, you can't avoid it. And you're not very tuned in to the elevator music until... The song that comes on is the music to which you and your spouse danced at uh, your wedding. Or maybe it was a song that was popular on the radio when you were a teenager and somebody that you thought you were in love with just smashed your heart uh, and, and you, you know, practically break out into tears to this day when you hear that uh, song playing. All of a sudden, the the so-called background music becomes is much more accessible to your mind because of the assumptions that are in your head about that particular song. So each of us has a, a whole encyclopedia of assumptions in our minds, and those assumptions are all uh, in a hierarchy depending on what is important to us or what is not uh, important to us. Well, that issue of accessibility becomes important, as you could imagine, in cosmology and what assumptions are at play and are accessible to an ancient person. Ancient people 
Uh, we look at a star and we're not thinking of a giant, uh, you know, fusion or fission reactors, right? It's fission, right? Mm-hmm. It is fusion. I had it right the first time. Yeah, fusion splitting. Fusion's coming together. Yeah. So uh, they don't think it's a, a giant fusion reactor, nor does a modern scientist typically think of when they see, you know, a, a star, they aren't thinking of a deity. Th- those are assumptions that, that are wildly different in, the, in accessibility uh, because of the different cultural uh, context. So different degrees of accessibility of context make themselves felt by the amount of effort that their retrieval requires. So the, the song, it doesn't take much effort to be, you know, or a smell to kindle a memory. Uh, if for me, but maybe not for you. Now, in a communication situation, listeners expect some kind of benefit. You didn't come here just because you had no you know, time to waste. You came here because you are assuming and hoping that I'm going to deliver something that is useful to you. Now, it may be new information. It may reinforce something you already believe, or it may challenge what uh, you uh, believe. Those are three different agendas that make thing, things uh, more or less important uh, to people in a communication scenario. And then the flip side of the conversation, speakers want to have a cognitive effect on uh, their audience. Now, sometimes it's more cognitive, sometimes it's emotional, but they want to have some kind of impact uh, or they wouldn't be speaking. You know, there are other things you could be doing uh, than talking to an audience and you don't care about those people and you don't care about what you're talking about. So there's something in it for both sides of the communication conversation that we could define as uh, relevance. Words are very important. They guide the audience to those assumptions that are most important to understand what the speaker or the writer is going to say. Also, there's this unspoken agreement between us that my words are going to be sufficient to guide you to understanding. At the same time, I'm not going to bore you with trivia. I'm going to try to be efficient uh, in the number of words that I use. I tend to be on the word, on the verbose side of things, uh, in most families, you know, this means time out. Uh, in my family, uh, dad, too much information, you know, T for too much information, because I tend to, you know, get too detailed and explain things. So depending on how good of a communicator you are, you will try to optimize the words that you use to give sufficient clues uh, and yet not uh, be too verbose uh, and overdo it. <clears throat> optimal relevance then uh, is that balance of words and signals could be even physical objects uh, in the environment that uh, enable the communication action to take place and Spurber and Wilson say that when a hearer following the path of least effort or we are lazy as human beings, we try to if you want to put it in biological terms, we are, are created to conserve resources and we minimize the resources that, uh, you know, that are at our disposal because it helps us survive. We're the same way mentally. So we want to get right to the point. We want to get what we the most we can get out of it uh, and move on. So uh, we. Uh, we grab what is most accessible to us, in, you know, initially, at least, unless that fails to make coherent sense. And then we start moving into other levels of, uh, of accessibility. But the hearer will follow the path of least effort to arrive at the interpretation that satisfies his or her expectations of relevance. And then in the absence of contrary evidence, uh, this is the most plausible hypothesis about a speaker's meaning. Unless there's some signal, I like to call them speed bumps in the road of communication, that you say, wait a minute, I'm missing something here. Uh, My wife and I have an agreement. We're in a conversation. I understand every word she's saying. I'm fluent in English, but I I don't understand, you know, the first thing about what she's trying to tell me. And so I'll say context. 
You know, we just have an agreement, interrupt each other to save context. And then she'll say, Janice, that's our daughter. And so, okay, then immediately my mind recalculates at the speed of light, recalculates everything she has just said. And now it makes perfect sense to me, every word that she said, not only the dictionary entries, but how those things work together with all of our assumptions uh, to bring about communication. Let's, uh, let's illustrate this, uh, how a, a statement triggers assumptions in context. What assumptions do we have about, uh, about trees? They have leaves. Okay, leaves. What else? Yeah, part of the natural world, shade. Living. Uh, yeah, a, a living entity. Tree. Oh, yeah. So then you get into metaphor, by the way. And, I, and we have a whole discussion of literal versus metaphorical. And by the way, uh, cognitive scientists have demonstrated that our minds will naturally default to metaphorical, metaphorical understandings of, of language, not literal. So this business of trying to read the most literal interpretation until that, you know, absolutely fails you first. And then you go to metaphorical. That's that's bad communication uh theory so uh so metaphorical meanings of trees what else no spot trees okay let me i'll throw up some assumptions shade water fuel height dryads now let's play with context a little bit it's what i like to call uh, with my students the zitzenleben game it's a fancy german word for the setting and life uh, in which uh something takes place a, a text Let's say uh, uh, we're out in, uh, in the field, you know, kind of open countryside, midsummer, <clears throat> middle of a hot day, uh, and I say, there's a tree. What assumption am I tapping into, and what am I saying? There's some shade. There's some shade, and, I mean, there's some shade. So what? But it's not relevant. Let's go over. Yeah, let's go get protection perhaps uh, from from it now let's say we're uh, you know it's been a long day another hot day uh and uh uh let's say we're in the desert and our uh, water bottles are getting low and i say in the middle of the desert there's a tree now what assumption have i tapped into yeah, where there's water, it's maybe an oasis, maybe so. Okay, so uh, let's move on to another one. Uh, now we're in the Arctic, uh, and it's getting nighttime, and it's getting cold, uh, and, you know, we may be underdressed, uh, and I say there is a tree. Yeah, so it could have fuel for burning, or even, you know, you tell children if they're in the forest, you know, go hug a tree because it stays warmer, you know, around a tree than it is out in the open. So it's something that the tree provides with regard uh, to warmth. We're going up a slope of a hill and we want to know, yes, it's a long way to the horizon, but there's a tree that we could climb. And I say there's a tree, you climb it, look over the horizon. So in each case, the context has changed. Nothing has changed in the words that I use. There is a tree. Look them up. Look those words up in the dictionary. Get your English grammar out. It will not help you understand what I'm really saying, other than at a very superficial uh, level of the locution, you know, kind of the meaning of the bare words themselves. But that, that's superficial uh, in terms of what I'm actually trying to communicate to you. So our background assumptions are triggered by the words that are used in conjunction with the context that we are in. That's just how communication uh, operates. So I'll come back to, now back onto accommodation. Accommodation is the adaptation uh, of language that's appropriate to the audience, as I already mentioned at the opening. And we, uh, as speakers or communicators, are, need to be mindful of the accessible Contextual assumptions that the audience has. That becomes very important when you're reading the biblical text and you're trying to, to squeeze it for cosmological information. Uh, what uh, is really accessible uh, to an ancient audience? All right, let's go on to some illustrations now of accommodation. I'll start with a non-biblical one. Uh, what do we 
assume about tomatoes. They're red. Next one, they're ripe. All right. Put it on hamburgers. You put it on hamburgers. Okay. Uh, what what uh, category of botany do you put the? Actually, yeah, yeah. So there's. Is it a fruit or is it a vegetable? It's a berry. It's a berry. Yes. Yeah, it goes out of the flower, right? So. Not a fruit. No oh, a berry, a berry is not a fruit? Oh my, I did too. So, so all these lectures I've been giving using this illustration is published in writing. Unfortunately, I can't erase it now. I was wrong. I called the tomato a fruit. So technically, that's not even correct. Okay. We didn't get away with it. Yes, okay. Thank you. So that I, you can get away with it. Why? Because it's approximately close enough to to convey what you need to say. Now, it, it's for sure a false assumption that we're talking about it being a vegetable. Uh, but yet, when you're going to the grocery store, you know where do you go to find tomatoes? You go with the lettuces, the cucumbers, celery. You don't go to the apples and the bananas. Now, why is that? Because the grocery manager has organized the uh, produce department according to culinary interests and uh, you know is it, you're going to go run to the produce manager and say why are you lying to me you put tomatoes in the vegetable section and you know don't you know you idiot the tomatoes are a berry <laughs> you know um, no you're not going to do that because you understand that the grocery manager is accommodating a particular question or of interest that you have that's relevant to your interests in that particular situation. All right. Now, what if you walked into a botanical museum and you found a tomato in the room where all of the vegetables are uh, illustrated? You probably would go to the curator and say, you idiot, don't you know that tomatoes are berries <laughs> and, uh, and and so uh, the change in context matters in terms of what our expectation of relevance is All right let's take now we'll move to the bible but a non-cosmological example leviticus says the priest shall burn the, all of the sacrifice on the altar as a burnt offering uh, some translations properly say food offering, the word that's there is connected to food, uh, an, offering, uh, an offering by fire with a pleasing aroma uh, to the Lord, All right? Uh, true and false assumptions, offerings uh, of food animals is acceptable. God gives the instruction because it's acceptable to sacrifice. Uh, animal have, animals have horns and those horns are dangerous. Well, that, that's true, but it's not in our expectation of relevance for what we're talking about in this verse, <clears throat> false assumptions. Uh, you make something pleasing to the deity, and it's like a bribe to get what you want. Uh, that's an assumption that a lot of people had. In fact, in Mesopotamia and in Egypt, that, that's kind of a prevailing assumption. Uh, and in Israel, ancient Israel, a lot of the uh, people had that assumption as well. Uh, along with it goes the assumption that the, the, the creator God needs food. Uh, the word that's used in the Hebrew text in Leviticus suggests food. But that's not what's being brought into or implicated into uh, the communication. In fact, so prone are we to the false assumption that uh, God gives us other instruction that if I were hungry, I would tell you uh, because uh, he doesn't need food uh, at all. He doesn't eat bowls uh, or drink uh, the blood of goats. So he corrects the misconnection that some people were, were putting together uh, with their uh, assumptions. Now, uh, one of the things, I'm not sure what happened to my slide on this. Ah, 
got to make an important, one important point. It was illustrated with the tree illustration. Let me back up just for a minute. And it, 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 it pertains to each of these first two illustrations. When in any given communication situation, there are assumptions shared by speaker and listener or writer and reader. And as we illustrated, the person communicating uh, is uh, drawing upon assumptions, but not every assumption that's imaginable about that topic. Not everything about trees uh, is imaginable. Uh, and uh, some, some assumptions like dryads, I didn't get to that one, uh, that there are some kind of spirits that live in the trees that come out at night to dance or whatever. You know, that wouldn't be an assumption that we would uh, have in the modern world, but in the ancient world, they might very well uh, have that assumption. Or in Narnia, perhaps, you know, C.S. Lewis's make-believe world. Uh, those are important, relevant uh, assumptions uh, to make. So when you speak, uh, you are creating a sub context uh, of the cognitive environment of those assumptions that are necessary to understand the communication. And what relevance theorists uh, do is they talk about the difference between something that is implicit on that topic and something that's actually implicated in the communication situation. So uh, when we were on the hot day, uh, we implicated the assumptions about shade or perhaps about water, but we didn't implicate anything about fuel or about height or about green leaves. There were lots of assumptions that were not implicated by the speaker in that communication situation. So in each of these examples of accommodation, if you want to tear them apart, you need to ask yourself, what is the author trying to implicate to draw into the communication situation as a necessary assumption to understand what's being said. And there are lots of assumptions that are just left on the wayside because they are not relevant to, the, to that particular speech act, act of communication. All right, so let's move on to some cosmological illustrations. The sun rose. All right, there are lots of assumptions that we can make about the sun, and, and these contexts will implicate, draw in different assumptions depending on what the author is trying to say. True, uh, when the sun rises, we connect that with morning. True, exposure to the sun, it, it, you know, it, it darkens the skin. You know, Dr. Warren, it damages the skin, you know, if you, you know, I don't know if they realize that or not. Uh, in our modern context, you might think about the sun coming up as the Earth turning on its axis. Well, there are also some potentially false assumptions that the sun revolves around fixed Earth and you're watching it come into view in its daily motion. This is, this is a classic example that's used. Uh, in biblical studies and in scientific conversations uh, with the Bible uh, about accommodation, the, um, the usual answer is, well, this is phenomenological language. So, the, you know, they're just describing what they see, and uh, we can't assume anything about their cosmology, uh, you know, in terms of whether the sun's revolving around the earth or whether the earth is rotating on its axis. Uh, and uh, the problem with that is that uh, it's phenomenological to us, but it was not phenomenological to the ancients. The ancients believed that the sun was part of a, uh, of a cosmological system, uh, and it was its own agent that had relationships and movements in relation to other objects. And the sun was something that actually was in motion, and it went across the sky in the day, and at that time it was in the underworld. Those were their cosmological assumptions. Now, as the author of Scripture, in Genesis, uh, we're talking about the sun rising. Uh, are, are, is the author of Scripture trying to affirm anything, implicate any assumptions about the, the system, the solar system between the earth and, and the sun? I would say no. Those, those cosmological assumptions are not implicated in the text. 
Now, the human author may have those assumptions that they're false, but they're not implicated in the communication, in the informative intention of the communication act. Now, the divine author, of course, knows all of this and is accommodating the realities of the ancient audience, but the divine author is not guilty of lying because the divine author and even the human author are not implicating anything about cosmology other than when you read the narrative in Genesis, the sun's ri rising, it means it's morning time. In the discourse, it's a temporal marker in the text. It's not saying anything about cosmology. It's, just, it's morning. And Abraham got up to go about his business. Now, uh, move uh, over to Jonah, chapter 4. Uh, Jonah is, you know, out in the desert regions, and we, uh, he, he gets ticked off that God is, you know, probably going to deliver Nineveh. And he goes, marches off to the east of the city, and he sits there in a front and pouts, waiting to see what's going to happen. And then we hear that the sun's coming up. And then we find out that the sun beats on his head. And so there are assumptions that are actually implicated in the text about the effect of, of the, the sun uh, on the human body in that particular situation. When the, uh, when the Shulamite in Song of Song, Song of Solomon, chapter 1, says her skin is dark, uh, it, she's implicating her background that she used to work in the field. And now she has a, and she has a suntan. So different assumptions, just like our example of the tree, Different assumptions are implicated, whether they're implicit or, you know, or not, is not the question. Lots of assumptions are implicit, if you want to think about it. What's implicated or being intentionally brought into the communication situation? And relevance theory gives us the categories to think uh, at, at that level of splitting out the assumptions. Death snakes. Um, Psalmist says that his enemies uh, have venom, uh, like the venom of a serpent, like the deaf adder that stops his ears so that it does not hear the voice of charmers. Uh, I, I've been taught that snakes don't have ears. Who's, who's, who's a, what's the name of a reptile specialist? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, 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 uh, Jack Collins, who's uh, also, I was on sabbatical with him. He is an amateur herbatologist, and he told me anyway that Snakes don't have ears. Uh, and so is there an error in the text here then? Uh, or uh, is, uh, is the author just implicating assumptions that are being made uh, to make a point in the metaphor and is not trying to communicate, teach anything about herbatology? Is that the right word? Uh, the author's not trying to teach us about snakes is drawing upon assumptions that, that the audience might have uh, for the sake uh, of making a metaphorical point. Charming works. That's another assumption that uh, the author uh, is not trying to affirm. He's just observing the reality that people charm snakes they, they think they are. You know, I don't know what the science is behind the snake following the movements of the charmer uh, as they move with their pipe, but it's not because the music's doing anything to the snake. But uh, there's a false assumption that charming works, but that's, that's not being commented on the communication of the text. So David is borrowing his comparison from a popular and prevailing error. Those are the words of John Calvin in his commentary uh, on Psalms. All right, uh, getting close to time out here. Let's take one last illustration. Uh, Genesis chapter 1, uh, the lights. True assumption. The sun and moon are, are more conspicuous than stars. Uh, it's true that conspicuous things uh, are good markers. And this we know from the context of Genesis 1, it's talking about marking the seasons. We have the assumption that the sun and moon uh, are uh, larger and brighter relative to uh, the stars, anyway. Relative. Uh, and uh, 
there's a false assumption that the ancients probably shared that the sun and the moon are absolutely larger and brighter than the stars, which is not true. Stars are absolutely speaking larger, most of them, uh, larger uh, and brighter. I don't know how big a, a uh, black hole is, but it's not big at all. So they're, they're pretty small. It's a dead star with clouds, right? <clears throat> now, the Earth rotating on its, on its axis uh, is also a related assumption to sun and moon, night and day. But, you know, I'm just throwing that in because it's not relevant at all to, the, to what is being communicated. So the author of scripture is drawing, both human and divine author are drawing upon the relative, the question of the relative of the, the brightness of them relative to the stars. And so they serve conspicuous salient markers of the seasons and no commentary is being made on the absolute uh, properties of those. In fact, nothing's being made about the properties at all, except that they give light and mark uh, the, the seasons. So communication is inferential. Uh, we don't default to what is literal in real human communication. Uh, and communication is inferential based on assumptions uh, that are accessible uh, to the audience in the ancient, uh, in this case of the Bible, ancient cognitive environment. Authors guide readers with appropriate implications. In other words, they tap into the assumptions and use words that pull those assumptions into the communication event. When expected relevance is met, people stop processing. In other words, you read through Genesis 1, and the ancient is not going to think fusion versus fission. I mean, th those are not accessible questions, even in their mind. Uh, misrepresentation can arise. This is true not just of cosmology. This is kind of generally true of all biblical interpretation. Misrepresentation arises from misassumptions or wrongly implicated assumptions. So if you implicate the wrong assumption about trees, you're going to miss the point that I'm trying to make. And assumptions that are weakly related to the informative intention are the responsibility of the audience and are not errors on the part of the divine or even human author. So there are, I didn't get into this question of the spectrum of strong versus weakly implicated assumptions, but there's a whole continuum. And if they are weak, you know, weakly implicated assumptions, then, uh, uh, then that can be countered against the truth value of the statement. All right. Well, thank you very much. Yes. Okay. Um, just the, uh, the ancient times and the biblical records indicate that God spoke in words to people like Noah, for instance. God said, okay, build an ark. Because it's going to be raining. It's so many cubits long, it's so wide, and they all the animals. Okay. How did God speak? Like, God didn't speak in physical words to Noah. Say, okay, Noah, come here. I want to talk to you about building a boat. So, how, how do you analyze it? Yeah, you're right. So, you're asking the, the question of uh, really not about relevance theory or anything, but just about revelation in general. Yeah. And I ask, oh, yes, yeah, so repeat the question. Thank you, writer. Um, the question was, how did God communicate, say, in a situation, telling Noah to build an ark uh, and giving the instructions? Um, well, I, the short answer is, I don't know. Uh, you know, and we infer from Scripture that there are lots of different, well, Peter tells us different manners in which God spoke to the prophets even. You know, sometimes it's a speech act. Uh, you know, uh, Ezekiel lays on his side, uh, you know, he puts up a frying pan. Uh, Isaiah goes, you know, goes about probably naked. You know, they, people like to say he was in his underwear, but I, you know, I don't know about that. Um, so there are speech acts uh, that uh, then sometimes can complement the physical object, you know, like in the, the apple. So sometimes words uh, can go with it. Sometimes it can be mental impressions. Uh, the, that's why in 
prophetic text that's called a burden. It's, just, it's something that's weighing on the heart of the person. And I haven't really have no idea how that works because I've never experienced a prophetic revelation. So, I, you know, I, it's dangerous to speculate about the psychological processes that, you know, that are, that are going on. So I can't answer your question. Yeah. But it is, ver- but uh, we do know there's plenty of verbal communication. Uh, I, I, I don't want to, to fall into pray, to, you know, to pray to the argument that revelation is just concept oriented. Uh, it is concept oriented, but it's also words in many cases. You've done a great job showing that when. Uh, great question. So the question is um, since context is so important and the assumptions of the original ancient audience and author are crucial to understanding what is being communicated. And we are at a distance from that by two to 3,000 years, you know, roughly. Um, and uh, it's a galaxy, for, you know, a long time ago, far, far away. And so we've lost a lot of knowledge of the ancient uh, environment. What, their, what was their cognitive environment? We've lost much of that. And so does that devalue the the the... I want to be precise here. Devalue what? It doesn't devalue at least parts of the Old Testament. Good. Okay. Especially those older parts of the Old Testament. Yeah, does it devalue part? Uh, does it devalue the, the text of the Bible at all? Yeah, yeah uh, I would say it doesn't devalue it, but it uh, highlights that often the biblical text is under, for us, underdetermined in terms of meaning. Uh, modern linguists will say, I think most all would, relevance theorists certainly would, they would uh, argue that all communication, even my address to you right now, all communication is inherently underdetermined to the extent that there, how do you know really what's, you know, everything going on in my brain as the neurons fire? I mean, that's, that's what I'm trying to, you know, convey to you. And my words are hopefully sufficient uh, to get that across. And the, and the more distant we are from the culture and time and space, et cetera, uh, the more at risk we are of supplying wrong assumptions. And we do that all the time as moderns. We, in, we read into the text our assumptions, or missing assumptions that were very accessible to the, to the ancients and that they immediately would have picked up on and, and supplied a more accurate meaning. So depending on, the, and it's not just Old Testament, it's, it's a problem in the New Testament uh, as well. It's, a, it's still an ancient uh, environment and what assumptions are at, at play for a 2,000 year old uh, Greco-Roman Judaic uh, you know, uh, audience, we have more information about the background and the culture of that than we do, say, at the time of David. Uh, so it's it's less underdetermined. And what I guess I would say, uh, you know, from a theological viewpoint, to try to be, be encouraging about this, is there's this doctrine, I can never say it, it's the perspicuity of Scripture. It's the clarity of Scripture. That is often misused to say that all I need is my Bible and the Holy Spirit, and I can understand everything. That's not what that doctrine teaches. The doctrine teaches that, that the basic rule of faith, you know, in other words, the one creator God of the Old Testament who made promises to Abraham and, you know, and, and brought redemption through him and his seed, or God revealed in Jesus Christ, uh, you know, a perfect God, perfect man. The basic brushstrokes are, are clear. Uh, and as then you move further away from, you know, the prophet, the witness of the prophets and the witness of the apostles to, uh, you know, more of the edges of uh, what they're saying and things get really fuzzy. It's why we got denominations. You know, but, but it's also why we've got the Nicene Creed, because there's a rule of faith that was passed down from, you know, from the, uh, the apostles to the sub-apostolic community uh, that then got crystallized, you know, by the early church. So is that, did that answer your question?
It doesn't solve the problem. It doesn't. I can't solve the problem. Yeah. Um, my my question, sorry, was somewhat related, if you don't mind. Sure. So the one was in terms of relevance theory, is it any different with oral versus written communication? Uh, given that most of scripture is oral tradition. Yeah, very good question. Um, relevance theorists, uh, so the, the question is, is there a difference between oral and written communication in terms of the application of relevance theory? <clears throat> in theory, no. The, they, they, uh, these principles of communication apply to whether it's an oral conversation or a literary text. And relevance theorists have had to go and, and make the case that, that literature is just as um, guided by these concepts of communication as uh, an, oral, an oral conversation. What's different, though, is that when once we leave an immediate communication conversation like between you and me right now, six feet apart. <clears throat> uh, if we want to communicate uh, to a more distant audience, there are less clues like the apples in the room or the walls or the screen. Uh, if I say, um, uh, you know, go to the board and we're in this room, you probably think of the whiteboard immediately. What, what if we're on a construction site? Now you're going to, you know, this up two by four. And so as you move away from the immediate communication situation, the communicator needs to supply more linguistic code, more actual words to make sure that, that it's adequate and sufficient to guide the audience to the right assumptions. And at some point, 3,000 years later, we're really in trouble. You know, back to the last question. So. Uh, yeah, this is another challenge of communication, and um, it was at work even in, you know, look at 1 Corinthians 5. Paul says, now when I wrote to you in my last letter, which was lost, and telling you not to uh, associate with unbelief, you know, uh, with, uh, yeah, I can't remember the exact word, I, I didn't mean, you know, I, so he had to clarify for them the assumptions that they were making about who they were to disassociate from. So even in that communication situation, fairly immediate, through a personal letter, the audience missed what Paul was saying. Um, yeah. So. Yeah. The practical theological implication of what you're saying is that the better we understand the culture to which the original words were addressed, the better we are equipped to understand what it says to us in our culture. Do you see any progress being made in the last few years in understanding the culture at the time the first two chapters of Genesis were written? Yeah, the, the big breakthrough was the mid to late 1800s when uh, ancient Near Eastern texts, uh, Egyptian and Mesopotamian uh, in particular, and then you're, you know, 19, you know, 29 or whatever it was, the city of Ugar, it was discovered. So they, they had a whole bunch of tablets there. When uh, uh, scholars began to be able to decipher the ancient texts, they began to break into the world, if you will, uh, of the ancient audience in a way that they never could before. Uh, and we've, uh, archaeologists have also uh, discovered, you know, and, you know uh, dug out a, a lot of iconography, pictures and some of these pictures have captions to them and we, we've been able to put together a lot of what the ancients uh, sort of their mental map of the cosmos was uh, it was known for 2000 years through Barossus that Barossus himself misunderstood the ancient Mesopotamians uh, and miscommunicated to you know the, his audience uh, a lot of things that that misled us about what the ancients believed. So the big breakthrough was the late 1800s, and, and you know, as we continue to you know to make archaeological discoveries and translate more texts, and like you probably didn't know that we have two Mesopotamian texts that start out with you know the cognate equivalent in Akkadian to the Hebrew word parashit in the beginning. We have two different texts. For Mesopotamia, not many people know that, but I mean, th th those are fairly recent discoveries that that are filling in, you know, our gaps of trying to make, uh, you know, uh, useful and knowledgeable comparisons between the biblical text and 
and the ancient Near Eastern texts that we have. Yes. Yeah. 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 No. I, just, I I wrote my whole whole book to really try to help my evangelical colleagues who are resistant, uh, you know, to, to help clarify all this. So the question or the comment was that we don't go to the grocery store and accuse the grocery produce manager of lying to us. <clears throat> uh, and so why then do we do that to the biblical authors? Uh, you know, in, in multiple different ways. A scientific viewpoint we use to apply to the chemical authors to say they got it wrong. Yeah. Now, uh, there's another move that's made by, say, uh, um, oh, uh, Hugh, uh, Hugh Ross's Reasons to Believe, where they think that there is coded within the text of the Bible uh, kind of a fuller sense that it, it takes a modern scientific um knowledge to sort of unlock uh, I, I you know I'm I, I'm very resistant uh, uh, I respect the scientists who are with uh, reasons to believe uh, I know some of them they're really good people uh, but I, that hermeneutical move I don't like because I think um, we have license to to see a deeper meaning in the text when it has to do with redemptive history we have the biblical text teaching us to do that with redemptive history uh, patterns of priesthood or sacrifice or whatever that find quote unquote fuller meaning in, in Jesus. <clears throat> but nothing uh, in the Bible gives us any hint that there's a fuller meaning uh, scientifically from the scientific angle uh, in, uh, in the biblical text. So I, I, I'm of the opinion uh, that the scripture just doesn't address questions of contemporary science at all. Uh, and I think that we um, are barking up the wrong tree, do a you know, double entendre there uh, from my previous illustration. We're barking up the wrong tree by trying to, to do uh, that. Now, what I, I like to, in this context, I like to bring up the notion of being virtuous readers. And, and you, made the, you made the point that it's unethical of us to go ream out the produce manager. And it's unethical of us to go to any text but biblical or Shakespeare, or in my view, anything. You know, I'm clearly not in the postmodern, you know, reading strategy camp here. Um, I think it's unethical to go to any text and uh, and make it say whatever we want it to say, and to especially if we go in there and start accusing the author of doing certain things with the text that is not part of their informative intention. We have to be virtuous readers. And treat a text just like we try to treat each other and understand uh, each other and respect what each other are saying in context. And we need to do that with the biblical text. That's a great, great point. So, um, great segue, actually. So, for some Christians who may read the creation narrative more literal, I think one of their hesitations can't be exactly that. As soon as we start to use accommodation or perhaps go and read it as literally as others do, they would say, well, you can manipulate anything now to read. So how, where do you draw the line in where, how far you take accommodation? Do you see my question? Does that make sense? Yeah. Well, I would like to speak to those Christians to say, I think you still need to use accommodation. Yeah, I, I don't draw a line anywhere in accommodation. <clears throat> the, the question I ask is, what assumptions were in the mind, in the cognitive environment that the author is drawing from to build a context that from which the audience infers meaning? You know, we all do this at the speed of light, but it's pretty complicated steps when you think about it. Um, and, and so, you know, accommodation, uh, like, uh, let me answer your question this way uh, about literalism. Uh, no one reads the Bible consistently in a literal fashion. And there is no figure of speech in the Bible that does not have uh, something that it points to a referent in the real world, if you want to call that literal or not. Every metaphor points to something in, you know, an idea, an object, an event. Every metaphor points to something in the real world. Otherwise, it's gibberish. So I, this literal figurative dichotomy is is not a helpful dichotomy that, that we often get you know stuck in. 
uh, as Christians, we have, to, we have to ask our relative theory helps me to keep on task. What is the text? You know, what are the words that are used in the text? What are they pointing to in the real world from which I infer, whether it's a real object or a metaphorical use, uh, uh, you know, of, of an object that's an illustration of something? That would be a metaphor. Um, what is it that that language is trying to draw from to help me infer the, the full meaning of what's being said uh, in the text? So, I, uh, yeah, I, I don't, uh, I think accommodation is always a possibility that, you know, because in every statement that is made, um, there are assumptions that are left on the sidelines, and there are assumptions that are being drawn into the, uh, into the communication situation. And when it's God revealing uh, truth to us, he often has to leave a lot of sidelines. Uh, and that's what we mean by accommodation. In fact, to Calvin's phrase, baby talk. Does that help? Yes. Okay. Well, thank you very much, yeah. Nate. Thank you.